Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the very first VLAB Summit. Thank you for coming. (laughs) 
we are more than incredibly excited to have you here today and we have a day that's packed with discussions, startup pitches, and networking opportunities and so much more waiting for you. So thank you for being patient and arriving on time. And now our agenda is about to start. So the conversations that we will be having today uh, will help us rediscover the journeys of entrepreneurs, explore new opportunities, discover collaborations, and our speakers will be talking about the rising trends and insights in Egypt and in MENA, what success really means, and even sharing their experiences firsthand. So without further ado, to kickstart the day, please help me welcome AUC Venture Lab Director, Dr. Ayman Ismail. Good morning, everybody. Sabah al khair. Uh, very happy to have you with us today and uh, very happy to have this beautiful day uh, uh, starting. Uh, we're getting into the 10th year of AUC Venture Lab. Time flies, but it's almost been 10 years since we started this experiment. And we can see a lot of change that's happening with you and with all the entrepreneurs that we've been working on. Last year has been a fantastic year for VLab. Alhamdulillah, we got awarded the top accelerator in Africa, which is uh, beautiful news, competing with many other programs in different countries. Uh, we reached 300 startups accelerated uh, through our core acceleration program and more than 100 and other uh, programs. And we're working on launching other additional programs next year that you're going to hear about in due time. That's going to be also uh, cutting edge and pushing the boundaries into new areas that we have not worked on before and that other, pro other accelerators have not worked on before. Uh, this summit is a new experiment. We've done our demo day for the past nine years. This is our 18th time. So we're trying a new format. We're trying to actually add more content. Uh, what we care about usually is more about depth, content that supports entrepreneurs, investors, and enablers. And that's what we're doing today. Uh, so in this program today, we hope that you get three things. One, inspire. Many people here are thinking about getting into this space, especially many young potential entrepreneurs who are starting early. And we'd love that you get out of this day with a lot of inspiration, thinking about what's next, what can I do, and that's very important. Um, the second thing is to connect. We have many co-founders. We have some investors. We have some tech developers. We have some entrepreneurs of companies that are accomplished. And the best thing you can do is to talk to them. So have side conversations, talk to people. There are really amazing people in this room uh, who have started their companies or who are thinking about it or who are looking for opportunities to work in a startup or collaborate with a startup. And the third thing is to learn. I mean, at the end of the day, AUC is a university. We're all about learning. We're all about generating content. We're all about actually learning about the new trends, the new initiatives, uh, what's happening in the market, getting some thoughtful insights from people who are actually in the kitchen and doing things. So I hope that at the end of the day, and we'll take stock, I'll talk to you at the end of the day, that you get out of this inspired, connected, and with new learning ideas that you get out of it. We have a beautiful program today. Uh, we have three panels, with one with entrepreneurs about building investable startups. We have a panel on fintech about what's happening in that space. And we also have a third panel on venture capital that we talk about the investment space and what's going on in it. And each one of them, you have really, really fantastic people, a line, an amazing lineup of speakers. So spend time, talk to them, listen to them, connect with them, and I think you will enjoy it a lot. We also have the startups from our demo day. So we've embedded our demo day throughout the day. You're going to have three segments with six to seven startups pitching and showing what they're doing. And those are really promising startups that I think you're going to hear about them a lot in the news in the next year or two, building great businesses, creating jobs, connecting people, solving actual problems on the ground. So that's the day that we have for you. Uh, and we also have the VLab Award, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And it's a fantastic opportunity to talk to one of the people who, are, who is leading the space and actually learn about their experience and recognize the work that they've done. So that's the day that we have. Uh, I'm going to talk to you throughout the day about VLab, so I'm going to do a detailed presentation about the VLab with our model, so for people who don't know about us, so I'm going to do that in the middle. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to do a lot of thank yous because this could not happen without 
a big thank you for the fantastic VLAB team and thank you for our partners and I will recognize both of them at the end one by one because we cannot do that without uh, them. So today we're happy to have you. We're happy to kick off this VLAB summit, our first summit, but also our 18th demo day and hopefully beginning of many more to come, inshallah. So uh, thank you so much, and I would like to introduce our keynote speech by Dean Sharif Kamil, Dean of the School of Business at AUC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Ayman. Mr. Khair, Alikum Gamian, Munawarena, and Sharafena in a Fika Terikhaya, Nisbal Kulu, Mutabitim, the Gaman Amerikaya, Khat Ewart. A very special place for a very special event. Like Dr. Ayman Ismail just said, we've been doing the demo days in Bidei Til Vilab to June Alfinu Talatoshar. Today we have a different format. El Hadaf Minha was to continue to bring together the community. Uh, uh, throughout the day, uh, there, there was already a couple of uh, workshops. Uh, there will be panel discussions, uh, pitches, uh, fireside chats, and the rest of the program, which is more or less diversified, including awards. Al-Hadaf Minnu, as we always do, A, sharing the knowledge, B, exchanging the experiences, but more importantly, telling the stories. We all learn from telling and, and sharing those stories. We, as uh, the School of Business and primarily uh, the Venture Lab, are extremely proud to be part of that growing ecosystem. We've always been part of it. Uh, we encourage different players, we support the different players, we endorse the different players, but we also learn from the different players, and that's uh, extremely uh, important. Let me just tell you, as a school, as a school of business, um, since we were restructured back 12 years ago now, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation was a key pillar in the school and only one of three. The other two are economic development and responsible business. And if you think of the three, they are very much related. Uh, you cannot be uh, innovative and uh, sort of an impactful entrepreneur unless you are responsible to the community and unless you can bring in uh, the positive side that impacts uh, the economy at large. Um, but also being part of the ecosystem brings through the VLAB to the campus uh, environment of car مختلفه, tumuhat مختلفه, masharia مختلفه. Not all of them go all the way, but it keeps people thinking in a positive way. And that's exactly what we wanted uh, to realize uh, through investing in entrepreneurship. It's not just, by the way, uh, the VLAB. The VLAB obviously is our flagship, but there are also multiple channels where we, as an academic institution, uh, we position ourselves as the educational partner of the ecosystem من خلال uh, uh, academic degrees, من خلال مشروعات مجتمعية, من خلال a center that supports the different stakeholders uh, and the like. Uh, I want to repeat that because we need to brag about this. Dr. Ismail already mentioned it. Uh, late last year in December 2021, the VLAB took the North Africa Award uh, by uh, Global Startup Awards. But this year in March, we got the continent uh, award. So we're moving in the right direction. And, and again, it's a journey. It's never a destination. And we're happy that that journey over the past nine and a half years, I should say, uh, actually, no, uh, nine years was extremely um, uh, successful. And we look forward to welcoming you. Before we know it, it's going to be a lot when we celebrate our 10th year uh, in June uh, 2023, uh, inshallah. Uh, today, we are very much delighted. I personally am delighted because I've seen just before the opening of the, of the event many, many familiar faces, uh, people who are very close to my heart. Uh, they come from different circles. Some of them are friends. Some of them are uh, alums from the school and the university. And that's what, again, as I said, what we're trying to, to, uh, to build as, as a community. Uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, includes so many different people. Uh, people who come up with the ideas, people who support the ideas, people who manage the ideas, people who help grow the idea, and, and, and that is exactly uh, uh, the motto that we try to bring in. We're not only focusing on the startups, but also the environment that enables the startup to actually grow uh, and flourish. Uh, throughout the day, uh, there will be uh, 
almost uh, just short of uh, two dozen uh, pitches, um, celebrating the 18th cycle of the Startup Accelerator and the spring 2022 of the FinTech uh, uh, Accelerator. Well, uh, as Dr. Ismail mentioned, and I, I I'm extremely delighted and proud to have uh, such a strong lineup of uh, uh, supporters in many different ways, uh, co-founders, uh, but also sponsors and partners uh, through the, throughout the journey. And I would like to just name them and thank them uh, before we start today, and we're going to thank them uh, again uh, throughout the day. For the Startup Accelerator, obviously the co-founder um, from the very early beginning uh, as an institution and as individuals, uh, the Arab Africa International Bank. Uh, but also the sponsors, uh, Brussels Foundation, he was and uh, Mountain View. So let's please give them a round of applause. <laughs> For the FinTech Accelerator, again, uh, from the early uh, days of the FinTech Accelerator, uh, the Commercial International Bank, CIB, but also our partners, uh, the International Finance Corporation and MasterCard. So again, please, let's give them a round of applause. Um, as I said, uh, just short of a, uh, two dozen pitches, but those pitches actually create endless uh, opportunities. Uh, in many ways, sometimes ideas would come for a different startup by listening to uh, an idea that is still in the making or uh, just getting there. Uh, why is that important? I just came back a few days ago from uh, one of the leading business schools uh, network conferences in the world. And whether we take this as a, a positive sense or a negative sense, whether it's going to be a, an upper or a downer, um, the keynote speaker in the, in the opening remarks uh, was asked, uh, where and how do you uh, uh, sort of reflect on the status of the world? And she responded by saying one word, it's a complete mess. So obviously this was a big word to start a conference uh, uh, with, but maybe she was right. Uh, if you think of it, um, we just came out of a pandemic or trying to get out of a pandemic. Uh, we have a war that might be looked at as very regional, but the impact is actually global. The global value chains have been affected for the last two years, and there's still we have repercussions across the board. Inflation that is going through the roof and the like. But again, she said, although it's a complete mess, it is that time where those massive disruptions take place, that people need to think outside the box, need to be more innovative, more creative, to be able to come up uh, with solutions to transform those challenges into opportunities. By the way, that is not a philosophical way to look at it. The more you are under pressure, uh, the less you become complacent, the, the, the more you need to think to come up with ideas. And those ideas in our world are manifested uh, as startups that actually can make a difference in our society. So people talk about uh, VUCA, uh, and we live in a VUCA world, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambiguity. Let's trash that, and let's just try to drop the VUCA and think of the facts. And what I mean by facts is actually flexibility, adaptability, creativity, transformation, and speed. If you think of the, uh, the facts, you will think of the entrepreneurs that we are blessed to have in Egypt across the board, not just in Cairo, but those who want to take their idea to the next level, those who want to build a startup that can impact uh, the community. And that's precisely what we're, we're focused on. So our entrepreneurs at this time and age need to be definitely innovative. They need to be thinking uh, 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 in, a, in a forward way. They need to be uh, innovative and surely in our society to be able to realize an impact across the board that is inclusive, they need to be uh, responsible. So before I conclude, uh, I have to um, thank my own team. I know uh, uh, it's early days, but I want to thank them now and thank them at the end. Uh, my own team uh, of the VLAB who worked tirelessly throughout the year across the board in many, many different products and services, not just the demo day that we're calling today the, the VLAB Summit but they worked tirelessly uh, as a team to uh, engage with the community, to maximize the impact, and become innovative as we go. It has not been the same since 2013. It has evolved to becoming uh, where we are today. Um, let's give a very strong round of applause to the team and to their uh, founding director and mentor, Dr. Ayman Ismail. Thank you very much.
And now, a word by Mr. Haytham El Ma'ayirgi, Group Chief Operating and Transformation Officer at the Arab African International Bank. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here, part of this um, AUCV Lab Summit. And uh, this summit is very special because it concludes for the Arab African International Bank, together with the VLAB, our 18th cycle. And uh, it's, it's a long history. In 2013, uh, Arab African International Bank collaborated with the AUC to co-found uh, VLAB and it was the first academic-based incubator at this time. And at this time, they were solving for issues like uh, business support and lack of finance and other related service to this. But it, it was very important. And, and right now, we look at it, and we look at uh, Arab African that comes with a long history. We have 15 years of experience in serving businesses, retail customers, and at this time, it's a special time for the bank because the bank is transforming and transforming rapidly, and what's happening here is very relevant to us. Um, last year denoted and marked a very important uh, event for us where we established our digital factory. And digital factory for us is not just a um, technology enabler, and it's not about technology, it's about changing our business model. It's our operating model. It's about changing the way we do things and, and, and look at it in a, in a totally new perspective because, as Dr. Sharif said, it's not about the It's about who's agile and who's fast and who can change very fast now. For us also, this factory was not about also creating a department. It's actually not a real department. It's, it's a big building. For those of you who drove by the Saint Street, they will see a big building or digital factory. It's actually a large collaborative space with all departments of the bank come together, together with their developers, technology, and also startups to co-create and find new solution about uh, customer centricity and, 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 and how to solve this. And if you visited there, you'll find a large number of squads creating, rotating around large specialization tribes, and we started to recreate the way we should be dealing with innovation and with startups and entrepreneurs. How we can put squads together where different departments can come together, collaborate, invent, and have the mindset of change and agility, because this is the name of the game. How can banks become technology companies with banking license, rather than a bank with a technology department? And this is the challenge we're facing ahead. Some, some will be agile and, and, and survive, and some will suffer because they're not managing to read the writing on the wall. Uh, and it, for us, it doesn't stop even innovating with fintechs and entrepreneurs on, on, on just digital products. Actually, we're moving our classical products, the way we think our and, and, uh, classical product, and how to change them with the mindset of collaboration, agility, and so on. The interesting part also that we're doing there is that we're creating what we call innovation support center and area. We're building a large area there where we're creating a, a conducive environment for fintechs, for startups, entrepreneurs to come together and start to test, explore, co-create. We look at this and we see how we're creating our own developed application. And you see there in different areas around data lakes, around mobile apps, around uh, efficiency, around uh, banking machines, et cetera, et cetera. But also how can we create our own solutions and own it being a big bank but also how to collaborate with others, create a good environment for them to test, explore, fail, try, and co-create with us. And it's, it's, it's a very big agenda for us. And that's why uh, VLAB is very critical for us now as we go more and more into this innovation uh, area and, and become more and more very focused on this is the way we're recreating ourselves now. Um, I'm, I'm really filled with excitement to see all this uh, brains and the discussion I have with few of you and the amount of enthusiasm, uh, resilience, and, and, and competence, and see how people are really adding values to themselves, and not only this, adding value to um, the big ecosystem and the economy and so on. Um, and very proud day for me. This place brings a lot of memory also, so it's a very interesting day for me. 
Uh, at last, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Sharif, Dr. Ayman for, for, for this, and also thank the team behind it. A lot of hard work that make this happen and made this impact throughout the last nine years. And thank you very much, and enjoy your day. Thank you. The VLAB Award is a tradition that we started many years ago. It's an award that goes to individuals or organizations that have outstanding endeavors to support the entrepreneurship community or to make uh, a sustainable impact. And so today, please help me welcome once again Dr. Ayman Smail to announce the Spring 22 Award. Thank you so much, Noor. So, uh... The person that I'm going to talk about today, I met him probably more than 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, he was working in an oil and gas company. He was very proud of his work at the beginning of his career. Uh, he went to do his master's in SOAS, the School of African International Studies, if I mention it correctly, or maybe the wrong name. And then he got there inspired with things that are beyond business and using business to change the world. Came back to Egypt worked a little bit again in the oil and in gas industry, and very quickly he wanted to focus on the energy sector, but change it in a different way towards green, renewable, and also making people's lives a little bit better. Um, I remember 2011, we went to Al Wahat Al Bahareya. I went there with him to see his very first project at the time, and it was basically desert and pretty much nothing. Uh, and now there is something out of it, and I'll tell you about it in a second. Uh, he had the aspiration to change that sector. At that point, people thought this is crazy. Today, everybody's talking about green. We're going to have Ashley Sara talking about what's happening. We have the COP27. Even everybody's talking about it. Climate resilience, renewable, circular economy, green, solar, all of these things. Uh, at that point in time, uh, he had a very interesting idea, which I think came out of his thesis, that if you want to, in Egypt, everybody lives at the Nile because we live on the grid. We're connected, we're connected to water, we're connected to energy. The only way that we can actually go outside is what people call disconnected communities, is you need to have energy that creates water, that creates everything else around it. If you have energy and water, you can live. You can build, you can have agriculture, industry, transportation, and everything. And the only way to do that is by having renewable energy at that uh, location. Started uh, the company at that point in time, 11 years ago, 2011. Started from scratch and kind of uh, at that point in time, nobody was interested in that space as much as people are interested in it to do. The company was very special. One of the very few companies in Egypt that actually had real R&D, invested in technology and tried to operate in a very challenging environment. And today it's probably one of the leading, if not the leading company in that sector with a lot of interesting ideas that nobody imagined uh, that can happen, uh, connecting with policymakers, with industry, with business in different ways. And uh, a story that's full of persistence and very interesting ideas that we're gonna talk about a uh, few, min few minutes ago. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this year's award to Ahmad Zahran and Karm Solar, a person who led the space in renewable energy. Okay, so Ahmed, so let's first start from the beginning. What's the story of Karm Solar? What did you guys do? How did it start? I mean, I mentioned the teaser, but would love to hear the story from you. Taib, um, first, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, back home. I mean, this place brings a lot of uh, memories. And uh, 
Uh, really, I mean, I, I, I want to thank AUC for always being engaged with uh, the community and keeping us in touch and, and engaged until today. I'm still very engaged for, with AUC and I'm, this is something I'm very thankful for and something I learned a lot from. Um, how did it start? I uh, was mandated to solve an energy problem of a farm in Wadi Natrun and I went there in 2010, uh, right before the revolution. And basically, um, it was an off-grid farm. They were not connected to the energy grid and they were consuming a lot of diesel. And I was trying to work on a solution from biogas, collecting the waste that they have, the organic waste, and building a reactor to convert that waste into a gas that they can use instead of burning diesel. And it seemed quite a complicated thing to do. And I remember very well, it was uh, March 2010, and it was quite sunny. And I wondered, why aren't we using uh, solar energy? And I started investigating that, and it seemed that there was a technical problem that prevents us from using solar energy for water pumping, which was the main use of energy at the time in those types of farms. And that's the thing that started the company, solving that problem, coming up with a technical solution that enables pumps to use uh, solar energy efficiently to pump water from the underground. And have you solved that problem by now? We did. Actually, that was one of the first things that we did. Um, and the first pump operated on the 6th of April, 2013. And uh, it was a 50 kilowatt station right next to our uh, uh, Bahareya campus. And uh, that was a big win for us. I mean, it took us six months to build 50 kilowatts. By solar standards, that's, uh, that's a joke. Uh, within the, that same time, you can build many megawatts of solar stations now. So where are you today? So this has been a decade and things have changed. The whole environment have changed. Where is Carm Solar today? Well, we um, are becoming a vertically integrated solar utility company. So we invest in power generation. We invest in power distribution. And we try to integrate the entire value chain. So basically, we want to, uh, you know, the, the unit with which you, me you measure electricity, the one that you uh, see in your meters at home is called the kilowatt hour. So basically, we want to take care of the kilowatt hour from the moment it is born until the moment it is burnt in our homes, in our factories, and so on. And that's a very long process. It uh, requires the power generation, power stations, uh, the power distribution, which is the grid that actually carries that kilowatt hour from one place to the other, Power management, power training, it's very complicated. It involves the building within which it is uh, consumed. Uh, you know, you visited our Bahareya campus. Now we're constructing another campus in the desert of Minya. Uh, it should be completed within a month. And a third campus in um, uh, Farafra. And the fourth in Marsala. So we're actually expanding all over the Egypt and hopefully uh, the region as well. So this is where we are today. We're in places uh, that might be uh, familiar to you. So we're actually generating and distributing electricity in Mars Alam, uh, in the deep south. That's where we've also designed and helped build a very nice hotel that is uh, sustainable and works partly on solar. Uh, we are in West Cairo in Arkan. We're in, we will be in East Cairo within a few weeks with uh, District 5, if you know the place. Uh, so we are trying to get uh, everywhere. We're in Minya, in Bahareya, Wadi Natrun, we're in many places. The space, the renewable space has changed a lot. So 10 years ago, the technology was still very nascent. There was no, there were no regulation. People were not educated. Demand was not there. Energy prices were reasonable. Now the whole environment has changed. So what does the environment for renewables look like in Egypt and globally, but more, mostly in Egypt right now? Egypt is a peculiar place when it comes to renewable energy. We, we always think of ourselves, unfortunately, as receivers of um, new technologies, new business ideas, and new business models, and so on. In, in the renewable energy space particularly, uh, we have an advantage that we have a lot of land, and we, have, um, we, we are rich when it comes to resources in renewable energy, whether wind or solar, but, but specifically solar. And this is giving us the chance to cheaply try out new things. So Egypt is going to be uh, one of the important hubs for renewable energy globally because of that. And one of the main areas where there's a lot of development, it's not only on the technical side, but predominantly on the economic side. So you will see that the way we interact with our utilities, the, the companies that actually deliver water or deliver power to our houses, 
it is going to be uh, changing within the coming uh, few years. And I think that Egypt is going to play an important role in that because of that opportunity. Ahmed, when people think about electricity, they always think about Shirkat al-Kahraba, the government. Yes. This is a sector that's typically, I mean, everywhere in the world, it's dominant by the government because it requires a lot of huge investments in infrastructure. Yes. You're getting into that sector yes. and you're actually literally running grids in some location, uh, working with the government, but working with different entities in those communities. How does that work? I mean, well, um, it's, um, I think we're much nicer, that's number one, but uh, also we offer uh, more value. I'll give you an example of something that we uh, piloted just a few months ago. So basically you have the power meter that you have at home. It's the only job that we've known for the power meter is it counts how much electricity we consume. But actually there's a lot more data on that power meter that we have not used. And in Egypt, at the same time, we have a problem with SME financing. So when small companies go to the banks, they really go through hell in order to get a loan. And banks are trying to give loans to SMEs, but the process itself and the requirements are so difficult. So within the law in Egypt, it is actually possible that you develop a credit score from behavioral consumption. And what the power meter has, the power meters that are installed at small shops and small businesses, it says how much electricity they consume. It says whether they pay on time or not. So it enables financial institutions to get a credit score out of it. So one of the things that we started is that with your power meter, and soon this will be open for individuals, you can actually apply for a loan that you pay back on your power bill. And the collateral for that loan is effectively the power meter itself. If you don't pay the loan, we'll cut the electricity. So basically, this is changing how people perceive power meters. Another thing is, you know, if you're distributing electricity in a region, and within that region, the, the meters connected to our network. You have that of the shop, you have that of the office, you have that of residential homes, for example. So they're all paying us for electricity. At a certain point in time, within the coming two to three years, you will have the option of uh, going to a restaurant in your area and paying for it by your electricity credit. So instead of paying with your credit card or with your cash, you'll have the power app with which you pay for your power bill and you can show it over there and it will be scanned and the, the price of your meal will be charged to your power meter that you can pay later. So you're turning into a fintech company, embedded fintech? No, we're not going to touch it. We're providing the platform for the financial institutions to use it. So we're not taking that risk, but we're only making the money out of it. That's brilliant. Okay, uh, tell us about your vision for that space and your vision for Carm Solar. So where do you see the space going in the next five years? I think 10 years is just too long, but for the next five years in Egypt, whether it's renewables or particularly solar. You know, we had a problem in Egypt in the 80s. There were a lot of companies working on solar water heating. So a lot of companies importing the, the things that you install on top of the rooftops at our houses and they're used to provide us with uh, heated water. And the problem is that many of those companies did not survive. So you'd install the system, and once you want the maintenance, it's not there. Now, this is a problem that this economy has in general. Institutionalization is a major issue. And this is one of the main things that we are working on. We are imagining this company not for the coming five years nor 10 years, but imagining the company for the coming 150 years. And the main thing that we need to work on, and really, we're looking at uh, Siemens when it comes to that. Um, and uh, this is a company that managed in, you know, keeping its uh, innovation and uh, keeping its hold on the business for a very, lo very long time. Well, I think more than 150 years now, or maybe 120 years. And this is exactly what we're trying to build. And I think that's the main contribution that our company is going to have that we're investing a lot and putting a lot of effort into institutionalization to make sure that the company is stronger than the individuals within the company itself and to make sure that it survives and keeps on innovating for the coming hundred years. Actually, I was going to ask you about the company itself and how do you build it, but I think this is a really nice segue. We know about the startup phase, so everybody here knows about what you do in the startup phase, but the scale-up phase and the institutionalization phase, 
How does that work? What do you do inside the company? When you start, you go from one person to 20, 30, 50, whatever. But to move beyond that and to keep, have the continuity and the, an established business that you can actually, as you mentioned, can survive beyond any individual. How do you do that? How are you doing this yes. today? The, the first thing is that you have to make sure that the business model makes sense. They actually have a positive gross profit and you are on your path towards making a positive EBITDA. I mean, I'm saying that today because over the last three years, I discovered a lot of business models that do not function like that. And I thought that I'm already behind in so many different things. But, but actually, I think it still works. I mean, companies that do not guard those things as fundamental principles are not going to make it. Uh, regardless of what the investors tell you, because investors could send you to hell as well. I mean, if you get uh, financing for a stupid idea, it could also be stupid money. So it doesn't really solve it. And I think that the business model is number one. Um, number two, it has to be a commitment by everyone for long-term decisions. Short-term decisions are very easy. And it is always easy to postpone doing certain things until the time is right, until we have more money. But what we started, I think, doing and um, you know, making sure that we invest into is, for example, the financial auditing. At the time when we were um, maybe five or six, I think employee number seven was a CFO, when we did not have to do that. But we thought it is important if we are to IPO in 15 or 20 years that we have good records from very early on. Hiring a financial auditor, when the fee of the financial auditor was a burden on the finances of the company at the time. But we thought that having a good financial auditor installs a certain type of discipline that we would need. And it really helped us, you know, we, did, we really did not have to do that. But again, when you are thinking very long term, this puts a certain commitment on the team to do certain things that m might be easily postponed. And when we got EDFR as an investor on, in 2019, and that's a government company, so they had their own regulations that they have to abide to, this made our job much easier during the, the due diligence. And then you really have to be very patient and building up bit by bit. And in our case, for example, I mean, the value of the company is measured by how many megawatts we have installed, how many megawatts are operational. We don't just take any megawatt to expand. We only focus on quality megawatts. What's the meaning of quality megawatts? That's a quality client, uh, um, a profitable contract, uh, a contract that enables us to grow, uh, not just in revenues, but revenues, profitability, and scale, and uh, making sure that while we are hiring our people that we're trying to install those ideals into them. At a certain point in time, when a small company is growing, there are friendships that build up between the people working there. And at another point in time, it has to change from a group of friends working together into an institution. And that's a very difficult bridge to cross. But it is a bridge that you have to cross to make sure that that company survives and actually grows in a meaningful way. How do you do that? A lot of hard decisions. Uh, a lot of unpopular decisions, but the, the whole idea is to make the organization stronger than the individuals. So me, as a CEO, I have to give up some of my abilities to take decisions to make sure that the board is more empowered and they have, um, uh, you know, they, they have oversight as to what I do, empowering the executive committee of the company more to make sure that they're involved with decision making, uh, making sure that recruitment is uh, you know, with recruitment, there are a lot of people involved with the decision making. Uh, focusing on processes and paperwork, uh, focusing on digitalization. I mean, those things are important because they ensure that the company is going to grow and that, you know, let's take, for example, what happened during uh, the COVID pandemic. I mean, the company actually grew during the pandemic and that was an achievement for us. Uh, look at what's happening right now with the, with the current crisis, the supply chain crisis and the, and the investment crisis. Uh, we will be able to survive it and we will actually be growing during that period because we've built the, 
um, the processes internally and the types of ethics that are needed to be able to deal with those types of uh, situations. And you always have to design, you know, you design your product, but in addition to designing the product or service that you're giving, mm -hmm. you need to spend some time designing the company as well and designing the company in a way that would enable it to deal with those types of circumstances and have the ability to grow. And that will definitely involve unpopular decisions. But it's not about popularity. I'm not there to be loved. Me and the executive committee and the chairman and the board are there to achieve the highest value for the shareholders, to make sure that people working with the company are getting their salaries every month, to make sure that they are doing financially better year on year, because the whole idea of doing all of that is to elevate our standard of living, elevate the standard of the infrastructure of the community. And to do that, you have to be very disciplined. So there is the whole story about your mission and vision and all the nice touchy-feely stuff, but at the end of the day, it boils down to doing business in the right way, making sure you have the people, the processes, really running a professional business. Yes, it, it is very difficult. When you have a written process, it's just written on a piece of paper. And that's very easy to be done. But converting it into a commitment that you have to do it over and over again, every time that you have to or every time that you do not have to, is difficult. It requires commitment like the one that you have in your marriage relationship or the one that you have with your friends or the one that you have towards your bank in paying the loan. It is that type of discipline, it is that type of commitment and uh, it, it really bringing yourself to do it, whatever the consequences are. Ahmed, you talked about tough times and COVID. Uh, most companies, startups that started in the past couple of years, uh, they started in a relatively favorable environment and now we're hitting a crisis. Most of them have not been through the experience of going through a crisis. I've probably seen five or six recessions in my lifetime. You've been since 2011 through probably four, Two five, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and a couple of crises yeah. and a COVID and whatever. How do people manage those tough times beyond the rhetoric and the stuff that people um, talk about, be resilient, all of that, it, practically on the ground? What do you do from your experience in the past ones? The, the first one is psychological, uh, which is being ready to pay the price. There is no crisis without a price being paid. And that has to be I mean, uh, straightforward. And let's not hide behind um, you know, uh, hopes. And the first thing is that the entire team need to be psychologically prepared to pay the price from their own income, from the opportunities that the company is going to get, from their ability to scale, and to focus on what is important. When you, uh, you know, we have one of the disciplines that we have, and I think this is very important. We, we have like a, a threshold for all of our projects. Before that threshold, we're allowed to uh, play and experiment and try everything and come up with crazy ideas and so on. But the projects that we push beyond that threshold, they have to make it and be implemented. And we wanted to have that discipline to make sure that the people only push the projects that they really believe in and they want to get done. And so far, our ability to complete the projects that, that have crossed that threshold is almost 100%. And that requires discipline. Really, it, it, it requires a lot of discipline and emotional detachment from projects. And I learned that through, um, I don't know if you know the, the name Khaled Hassouna. Khaled Hassouna was on our board for some time. And at the time, I was emotionally attached to one of our products, the solar pumping, because it's the one that we've, uh, we've uh, built uh, and we have the patent for it. And it was uh, quite, uh, uh, it's a genius product. It's very sophisticated. You know, you had different pumping stations talking to each other, doing weather forecast. It was really I mean, a kick-ass product. But the fact that some small shops, small engineering shops in the countryside, they came up with a product that was, I think, 30% of our price. And it, did, it was not sophisticated at all, and it did a fraction of what we've done. And it, I, will, I mean, the, the lifespan of our product was like 25 years. The lifespan of their product was five years. But they had something that we did not have, that the market did not care about any of what, of what we've done. And they cared about their product. It was more attractive because of the price. 
and our product was failing in front of our eyes but I was emotionally attached to the product and I kept trying hard pushing the team to try hard with it when we should have buried it and it was Khaled Hassouna who pointed that out and told us that we have to move on and at the time of a crisis teams will be confronted with the same thing you have a problem raising money you probably have a negative EBITDA you are seeking a positive cash flow investors are suddenly changing their mind and if you if you don't take those types of decisions what to focus on and what to carry on with and what to kill um, the chances of the company surviving are going to just go down and the first thing is that the entire team has to be psychologically prepared for that and I mean it I mean the the executive committee or the bigger middle management need to talk face to face and decide what they're going to do tough times call for very interesting things last words of wisdom advice for someone who's thinking about starting a company today in this very interesting environment should they do that and if they do how do they do it one of the biggest questions when you are starting something specifically a company is when should I stop when should I pull the plug and declare that it is a failure and that the only person who knows the answer to that question is the person going through that journey himself or herself when do I decide that it is not going to work it's a very difficult decision because maybe uh, you know some in the past we used to give uh, you know we used to hear the guidelines of one year try for one year if it doesn't work then leave it but maybe it's one year and one month maybe it's two years it really differs and the one thing that I would advise anyone is to have certain milestones and try to make them as close to each other as possible and as small as possible so very small milestones maybe one every month one every two months just to make sure that you have traffic lights of what is telling you to carry on and stop because at a certain point in time if things do not go the way that you want you will want data to support whether you should carry on or not and it might not be related to how much you've spent it might be related to how many milestones you've achieved that are telling you that you're on the right direction and make sure that you have a bit of savings before you do that that's fantastic most of the people for the past couple of years were more excited about the, the growth grow 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 at any cost and I think in those times where the economies are globally is getting into challenging part it's very important to listen to the wisdom of people who have done it with the cycles of ups and downs and who have the resilience and resilience is not just a dictionary word it's actually something practical about being psychologically ready managing the cash flow preparing to do the tough choices sometimes killing some products or businesses to make sure the company is continuing and I think the theme for the next year is more about surviving but for new startups I think it's a great time to start as long as you understand the environment that you're in and you can build something that people want and can pay money uh, for Ahmed thank you so much congratulations very proud of everything you've done and uh, I think some of those ideas are things that would love to have everybody listen to and take them forward thank you thank so much you. Ahmed So many exciting plans for Carm Solar. So on that strong note, uh, we welcome our very first panel discussion for the day, Building Investable Startups. Please join me in welcoming even more brilliant entrepreneurs on stage uh, to tell us all about it. Ahmed Ashour from Pylon, Hossein Toher from Orcas, Ines Siom from Flextalk, Hussein Mumtaz from Coins, and the panel moderator, Muhammad Rahmi.
مساء الخير يعني ثانك يو فور فور ذس جريت انفايت اتس جريت تو بي باك ات يور هول اتس جريت تو بي وذ اي سي دي لاب اند اتس ايفن جريت تو بي شيرينج ذا ستيج وذ ساتش ان امبرسيف لاين اوف فاوندرز ماي نيم از محمد رحمي اي هاف تو ساي اي واز ا ليتل بيت the first time i heard the title of the panel building investable startups my first impression they hadn't shared the names of the panelists yet my first impression was that i'm going to be in conversation with investors and i felt this is going to be a very predictable conversation because you know the, the formula is the same uh, but obviously things change when i knew i was going to be interviewing founders because everyone has uh, their own different experience in navigating that formula you know like the themes of building an investable startup And I say invest in the startup with a lot of caveats because obviously you build the company for other purposes, not just to be investable, but you know, it is a means to an end. Uh, but the themes overlap with uh, things like talent, product market fit, um, data, um, margins, economics. So there are so many themes that would make you an investable startup, but how each one of you navigate these themes differ. And uh, the diversity we have with us today is really incredible. So I want to take a moment and just to acknowledge the diversity on the stage and maybe ask each one of you to give a one minute uh, quick intro, who you are, your startup, and maybe a 30 second or 20 second in your case, uh, description of what your business is. Go. Yes, sir. Uh, My name is uh, Hussein Mumtaz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Coins. Uh, Coins is basically building a social food ordering platform for takeout customers in Egypt and Saudi. Basically, we are telling the walk-in customers to follow the brands in Coins, then they can order from the brands. 90% of them actually order from the brands. 80% of them places reviews. And these followers can grow their favorite brands by inviting their friends to, uh, their friends to, to try these brands. Uh, I'm a computer engineer, original computer engineer. Then I turned to uh, co-found a software house. Then I co-founded Coins. Uh, we, uh, we got funded from uh, two uh, US-based VCs. One of them is uh, uh, the VC arm of the Tenders co-founder, Justin Mateen. Uh, we've raised uh, till now, I think, around $7 million. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Ines? Okay. Um, I uh, started uh, my career in uh, corporate, in multinationals, in Nestle specifically. Uh, I spent five years there, um, and then I realized that after five years that I didn't want to be in corporate much longer, pretty much like going through, jumping through hoops to get a small thing done, and I wanted to solve a real problem. Um, at that time, I joined the, one of the top startups in the region, which was Karim. Um, Karim at the time was building Karim Bus. Um, so I joined um, head of operations for Karim Bus, and then I became GM for Karim Bus in Egypt. And then when COVID hit, things, as you can imagine, was difficult for a mass transit business. Um, and so at, at the time, uh, me and my co-founder started to discuss the idea of what kind of companies we wanted to build. Uh, and we were very much um, sort of taken with the growth in e-commerce, especially brought out by COVID as well. Um, and that's when we decided to build FlexDog together in December of 2020. And what FlexDog basically is, it, it, it basically is an end-to-end -end, um, fulfillment or tech logistics business that works with uh, merchants that sell primarily online, providing all of their operations from, from storage to order preparation to, um, to shipping um, using our in-house um, tech um, sort of uh, business uh, stack. And um, yeah, and that's been kind of our, our journey. So we know a little bit about starting a business through tough times or during COVID, and it's been, uh, it's been an interesting journey since then. Very timely launch, yeah. December 2020. Hossein? Um, <clears throat> uh, hi, uh, my name is Hossein Tahir. Uh, I'm uh, the CEO and, the, and uh, the head of product of Orcas. Uh, Orcas is a platform that connects private tutors with Uh, students. Our main customers are the parents, actually, the consumers or the users are the students. Um, lately, we've been trying to manage the educational experience through adding some layers of content to the experience. Uh, I uh, graduated from, medicine, from uh, the med school, uh, Osrayni, it's in the end of the road, so uh, it adds a lot to my experience. However, it's not something that is directly related to what I do. Just wanted to put it out there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Hi, I'm Ahmed Ashour. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pylon. 
Um, I've um, started my career working with one of the leading meter manufacturers across emerging markets. I was handling uh, the commercial team covering from the Philippines, Ghana, Zambia, Ethiopia, Czech Republic, Mexico, and Brazil. And then uh, in 2017, me and my co-founder, we started uh, Pylon. Uh, after we found that there was a gap when it comes to addressing the challenges facing the emerging markets, especially the distribution sector of water and electricity. The sector loses around $400 billion per year. So we've developed our own technology where we detect where the leakage is happening, where the losses are happening, and act upon it. Also, we have a very strong sustainability angle. The electricity sector um, emits the is the highest emitter when it comes to CO2 emissions. So we're talking about 40-something percent. And using our technology, we are able to reduce it by 25 percent. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Ahmed. Taib, I'm going to jump right into it. I think the number one ingredient for building um, a scalable business, which in turn is an investable business, is people and talent. And I think uh, we all heard Zahran earlier. He was talking about his own journey. Phenomenal, you know, and, and I think a lot of that revolves around people and managing people and retaining people and attracting the right people in the first place, especially uh, for early stage ventures. So I want to pick on you, Ines, first, and uh, tell me about your journey with uh, people and talent, especially that you're the youngest of the companies on that stage. You've just raised the round, I think, about last year. Yeah. So just I want I want to understand how are you thinking about talent in the company, how from a from a philosophical level but also like tactfully how do you attract talent how do you retain your talent how do you build culture how far are you into the process so just sp spill it all please for okay, us. Sure. Um, I think like you rightfully said this is the backbone of building a business and it is the most important decision that you need to make and it is also the hardest thing to do um, in, especially in a country like Egypt, it's, it's not easy to find the right talents. If you're building a tech company, it's even harder to find the, the tech mm -hmm. talent that, that you need. So it is a constant struggle, and I think all founders will agree that this is fundamentally the hardest part, and as you grow, it becomes harder and harder. Um, and fundamentally, when we're starting to think about this or thinking about hiring, I think there is a part that we have to do ourselves first, which is asking yourself, what do you really need? So what are the key profiles that you need? What exactly do you need these people to come in and, and do? It, being unclear about that also is a good way to lose talent quickly because they come in and they feel like they're not very sure what you, what you want them to do, A, and B, you need to be willing to give them the right empowerment and the right space to experiment and to make mistakes. So a big part of that is, as a, as a founder, it is of course your company and you, are, you have a specific vision about how you want things to go, but being able to sort of provide that space to everyone that is coming in to believe that they are an owner, to believe that they have empowerment to, to fail and to try things is imperative as well. Um, and besides that, when looking for the right talents and knowing who to select, a lot of people spend time thinking about maybe experience or technical skills, which of course are relevant. Um, but mindset is equally important, if not even more important than even having that. Because building a, a startup, it's basically, there's a lot of uncertainty. I, we always tell the, the team, it's like we're sitting in a dark room and trying to like hit the wall to find the light switch. And this is what it feels like every day. So having the right people that are able to navigate that uncertainty, that have that winner's mindset and that fighting spirit, and are curious to continuously want to learn, is really important and it's really important to find these people because they will go the distance with you. Um, otherwise, if they're just here to just look for um, a, a job or make a good salary, then potentially they will probably not continue in the journey and they will, like, they will not want to uh, continue once the obstacles hit. And l last and by, by no means least is they need to buy into the vision of what you're trying to do. So it's really important that they are excited by the problem that we're, we're solving, that they actually want to, um, to sort of come in every day and look for solutions and, and try different things because if they don't care about what they're, what they're solving, then potentially they're not gonna be committed to it and they will not continue either. But in, in very practical terms, how do you curate this excitement? How do you make sure this alignment is there? Because that's crucial, 100%, yeah. uh, especially in the early, early, early years. 
I think it's important when you're first um, t talking to them, having these chats with them, you understand what their thinking is like. What are the things that they fundamentally are, are drawn to? What are the issues that they are passionate about? And it's important to also take them through your own thinking about not just the current state, but the vision. And spend a lot of time explaining to them how you see the future and how you, what part do you see them playing in that future uh, as well for them to resonate with that, and it's okay. Some people might not be that passionate about education or that passionate about logistics, or it, it depends on the thing, but fundamentally, if you share that vision as, as, as clearly as you can with, with them and you feel that you're able to, to bring them on board with it, that they become as excited as you are and give them this, the right space for them as well, it's potentially gonna create a good match between the two. Do you guys think about culture in the company? Is it, 100%. Is it articulated or is it implied? 100% culture is one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about and it's one of the things that having been part of, of Karim, in my opinion, Karim yeah. was the most successful. If you, you ask me what is the one thing that Karim got right, it's culture and it sort of propagated everything else that came um, after that. So we spend a lot of time thinking actively about the decisions that we make day in and day out and how that affects our culture and what our values are. And I remember one of the things that, having been part of that experience, before we even launched even anything, we sat down and we agreed what would our values be and what would we want to hire based on, what would we, what would we want to make sure that everybody in the company believed as these are the things that we care about uh, the most. And you can have the best strategy in the world, the best decks, the best ex Excel sheets, and if you don't have the right culture to implement and to execute, none of that is going gonna, is gonna to come true. Absolutely. Thank you. I think uh, if, if, if one's to think about the, the second ingredient to being an investable startup, investors and founders and employees and the community loves a company that is solving a real problem, right? And not just in an abstract way, but really they've developed uh, a solution uh, that is very tangible, that is solving a real problem uh, that is a necessity for people. Um, and a lot of, I, I think a lot of experimentation and iteration and, uh, um, you know, uh, discussions go into reaching that product market fit. And obviously it's something that's a very important ingredient for an investor because once it's there, this is when, you know, you start to generate growing levels of revenues in a way more, that's, in ways that are more consistent and continuous. Uh, so I want to poke at you, Ahmed, and just to tell me about the journey of getting to the product market, especially that you're coming from a background, from a corporate. So you've spent a lot of time inside seeing the pains from inside, and then you went on to build a solution for it. So just if you can share some. Sure. Uh, it's definitely uh, the most interesting uh, journey to find the product market fit. Uh, when we started building Pylon, um, the very first days we, we went and we copied, exactly copied the big four or five players in the field. The likes of Siemens, Schneider, Oracle, SAP. And uh, then we found that we, uh, we have a product, uh, but we have a product that's tailored for developed economies, not for the challenges we have in emerging markets. In developed economies, they want to uh, be more efficient by decreasing the losses, let's say, from 7% on the grid to 3%. For us, we have totally different uh, challenges. We have a very low uh, collection rate of electricity. We have uh, lots of um, tampers, and by tampers, I mean people stealing electricity. So we went and we changed our mindset to be focused on efficiency. What the utility or what the distribution company wants at the end is to be efficient. So we built our um, strategy around efficiency, focusing on, on the main pillars of collecting the revenues, detecting the leakage happening across the network, and detecting who is stealing electricity uh, mainly. So it's, it, uh, it became a totally different mindset. Then we went on and we went um, a step further to challenge anyone who would, who would come and compete with us in this uh, sector uh, by offering financing as well, because many of those utilities are already losing 30 and 40 percent of their revenues. So we went there, and so they are already bleeding, so they are not really in a situation to go and invest hugely into changing their infrastructure and upgrading it to the smart grid infrastructure. So we went and, offering, and offered financing, and by offering financing, we offer our solution, but at 17 percent cost rather than the conventional or the competition. So you keep on tweaking. Um, once you find this sweet spot of the product market fit, you keep on, um, on tweaking in order to make it 
even harder for any competitor to uh, come and compete uh, uh, with you later on. How long or how costly was that process? Yeah, of I can say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a continuous roller coaster. Continuous, so we, right. we started in, in 2017 and then we kept on going till now, until this very moment we are always enhancing our solution and making it uh, harder and, and then yeah. And even I believe uh, there is a very interesting book uh, called uh, Blitzscaling, I highly recommend it. Reed it's Hoffman. by Reed Hoffman, yes, definitely. Reed Hoffman. So, so in, in, the, in, in the tech ecosystem, it's a, it's a, it's a continuous find, uh, continuously need to keep on finding product market fits, let's say. Yeah. So once you have, you reach a certain point and then uh, of finding this product market fit and you inject in cash, so you grow, you, you blitz scale, you, uh, literally. And then after that, you need, if, if you're not going to find another product, so you will going to reach maturity. So you will need to find another product, an another product market fit that will even enhance your offering more or a new line of business to keep on growing and to keep on blitz scaling and growing further. Absolutely. Yeah. Does this resonate with you? Because, I mean, we've met a long time ago and yes. you were the CEO of um, ShopX yeah. and then this pivoted and uh, rebranded yes. pivoted to, uh, yeah. to coins, so. Yes, BMF, يعني, uh, product market fit. I'm going product market fit is a very, very hard problem. Okay, well, definitely it's a continuous process, but I shouldn't tell him so I have a few thresholds. No, my dad, the two foot door, I take it. Okay, if I am a penal push will pull a low end of time in product, I believe PMF, I believe product market fit, product market fit, basically, and in market, I said product attack at the low element more in a Liha element more in a yes, Liha element more in a yani, Helena didn't say that let's second of the room in Shway. لو انت شعرك بيولع <تصفيق> واديتك طوبة تحاول تطفي بيها هتحاول لان البين از فيري فيري سترونج فالبي ام اف معناها ان الماركت بيشد البرودكت بتاعك حتى لو مش معمول باحسن طريقه حتى لو في مشاكل كتير حتى لو التيم بتاعك لسه مش مظبوط البرودكت ماركت فات لو قوي احتياج الماركت للبرودكت بتاعك كل ما يبقى قوي كل ما حياتك هتبقى اسهل سيجنيفيكت كل حاجه ثانيه تبقى اسهل البرودكت ماركت فيت اصعب حاجه فيه ان فيلا احنا قعدنا يا جماعه البرودكت ماركت فيت اند اتريت وبرضه بنغلط فيه ليه لان في فيري سترونج كونفيرميشن بايس بيلت ان جوانا كبن ادمين بيخلينا ما نعرفش نوصل للبرودكت ماركت فيت بسرعه انت بيكون عندك فكره فكره بتسيطر على دماغك وبتبقى بتبدا ت ت ت يعني دماغك تدور على الداتا بوينتس اللي في الماركت اللي تخليك تقول ان دي فكره ناجحه ان فكرتك حلوه وده ضد البرودكت ماركت فيت فطبيعتك البشريه بتخليك بتخليك ما تروحش للبرودكت ماركت فيت بسهوله فانت لازم تحاول تفوش باك البايس ده ماشي تتعامل بالارقام بس ودايما لما بيتسال امتى تحس بالبرودكت ماركت فيت هو كانك دوست على لاند ماين لو انت بتسال نفسك انا عندي برودكت ماركت فيت ولا لا غالبا ما عندكش اوكي Product market fit انت بتحس بالبول بتاعت الماركت بتاعت الماركت قويه لدرجه ما ينفعش تتلخبط فيها. Do you guys agree? Do you agree with this landmine uh, analogy? Cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, بس I think ان لو في يعني اول نصيحه انصحها لاي حد uh, وانا غلطتها كتير يعني مش عشان اعملها صح يعني ان ركز على البرودكت ماركت فيت على فكره يو كان جيت فاندد بيفور برودكت ماركت فيت واكشلي سيد فاند بيسكلي هدفه ان يساعدك تلاقي البرودكت ماركت فيت yes. فعادي انت ممكن تاخد في سي فاند قبل البرودكت ماركت فيت والمشكله اللي بتحصل ان وانس ان انت بتاخد في سي ماني دي بوش يو تو جرو ماشي وده مش صح انت المفروض تفضل تبوش باك على البريشر ده تركز على البرودكت ماركت فيت ولما تلاقيه ساعتها بقى ريد هوفمان بليت سكيلينج موديل يشتغل البليت سكيلينج موديل ما ينفعش يبدا قبل البرودكت ماركت فيت Hmm. I just wanted to add a couple of dimensions, yeah, just to sure. organize uh, the answer. In our case, I'll talk more about the experience that we are living or going through. We have the supplier side, and you have the consumer side or the demand side, and then you have the marketplace in the, in the middle that is the business. 
So when you're thinking about product market fit, it needs to be perfect for the supplier. So it needs to make perfect sense. In our case, it needs to be profitable. Maybe in Karim's case, the, ride, the drivers need to make money. At the same time, the, the riders, or in our case, the users, need to feel that they are getting value for whatever they're paying. And in the end, and maybe this is something that has been forgotten, and now people are talking about it, finally, it's the profitability for the business. And it was mentioned earlier in the fireside chat, are the unit economics, economics uh, rational? Do they make sense? Is this going to one day cover for all the expenses below the, like is this a viable business or, this, or is this something that is too good to be true? Of course, if I can get a ride from point A to point B subsidized by 50%, this could be viewed as market, product market fit. When it's not, it's just too good to be true. It's not real. So those three dimensions, I think, are very important to uh, PMF or product market fit. Which is what Hussein was talking about. There just organize. It can definitely be funded even before the, the product market fit. It doesn't mean you've reached that. Type. Now that you've, uh, yani, uh, I have you, I want to ask you about something else. I was reading uh, in one of the press releases that you know, you're starting to operate in Lahore, right? And I think this idea of, uh, you know, growth and the like a, a big addressable market uh, whether it big in size or big in value is something that's very important to the investability of a startup it's something that investors look uh, close at etc and you end up seeing a lot of founders a lot of startups you know saying like big headlines like we're expanding into Africa we're expanding into Latam we're doing this we're doing that and as soon as they're challenged on it they're unable to you know actually explain why it is if they're choosing Africa, I mean, assuming that Africa is uh, at that one single destination. So I want to understand from you this decision to go into Lahore, what led you to that decision? Uh, and if you've already launched today, so what is the plan for the coming period? Essentially, I want to know how you evaluate, you know, expansion opportunities and what actually prompts you to go after these opportunities versus saying, no, thank you, I don't think that's the right time. Okay, before I answer, it's the idea of expansion in itself is either, uh, like you said, to make the company more investable or to make the company actually make, to increase the profits and the revenues for the company, which I think should be the way you go about it. So you don't expand to attract financing, you expand to actually increase the profits and the revenues. However, in our case, without tackling this point, what we did is we researched the market. And by the market, we started to look at the markets that seem similar to Egypt, to, uh, in either in behavior, like markets like Pakistan that are big with uh, low median age, so a young population, high unemployment, teachers are not making enough money, education system is not the best, so this kind of similarity. Or you're looking at uh, similarities in languages, in, uh, it's like the Saudi market, for, its, uh, for example. So we had to pick between both markets. Uh, the Pakistani market is big. The, the Saudi market is smaller. However, the average uh, um, spend per person is much higher. So what we uh, did is we decided to take it as an experiment. We're going to expand to Pakistan. We're going to experiment with that. We're going to learn how to set up a company. There are a lot of legal work involved. There's a lot of team uh, hiring, team building. You fail and you, you recover. So we looked at it as an experiment. And it might have been the wrong uh, step. Mm. Maybe Saudi Arabia would have been better. Maybe we should have waited on the expansion and focused on Egypt first. However, uh, looking at it and looking at everything we do as if it, this is an experiment, and also like it uh, was said in the fireside chat, I agree with a lot with, with, uh, of what has been said, is like if there's a clear success metric, very clear, you don't get distracted. You know, okay, this is what I'm waiting for. If this is not met, then you stop this experiment or you modify the experiment because you cannot say, oh, I'll try it for one school year. Because maybe, as you said, you need the school year and the summer. You, you, you never know. So you've identified kind of milestones. If not achieved, the experiment will, will continue or will not continue, basically? Yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Type. Um, I want to, you know, just pivot a little bit uh, the discussion uh, towards, again, something that was Zahran in his discussion with Dr. Ayman mentioned 
uh, was talking about, uh, which is kind of the environment that we're living in right today. Uh, I think from a global perspective, uh, increasingly we're moving towards a downturn. Uh, it's trickling down to the startup ecosystems around the world. It's definitely, there's a spillover on Egypt. It's not the easiest of environments to be operating in. You've launched your startup in a very difficult situation. Uh, but I want to understand how you guys are navigating this uh, environment uh, within your companies, within your startups. How is that impacting your teams? How is that impacting your fundraising plans, your product development, etc.? So maybe I'll go back to you, Ines, and uh, to start. Sure. Um, I think definitely touching on the thing that we said initially, and just also like to tie it into the the title of the panel: in building investable startups. Fundamentally, just don't build it for the investment. Like this is the, the the main sort of message is think about in building the business for the business for for it to make sense on its own for it to be a business that people are fundamentally willing to pay for for the service at its fair price that would enable you to to grow better and people sometimes lose sight of that even big startups lose sight of that even the time that I was in in, in Karim before the Uber acquisition from being from the inside growth was the name of the game at any cost. Even if it was at negative margins, it didn't matter. This is what investors wanted to see. It was just hyper growth at any cost. And then once the Uber acquisition happened and that glass ceiling shattered and people realized that the, the uh, price of the share plummeted to the ground, it immediately shifted to unit economics overnight. And we sort of had to um, flail around until we managed to turn the business um, around. And so the main thing that we need to do in, in times of like these, or even it should be like a, the, the the narrative overall is is what I'm doing. Does it make sense? Are customers willing to, to to pay for it at the fair price? Can I turn this into a business that can that can grow and continuing continuing to tap on this and continuing to question different elements of the business and ask, am I going in the right direction by this metric? Is is extremely important to be able to look at. Equally important is also this idea of trying to be as objective as as possible when deciding not just what to do, but also what not to do, which is equally important, having that ability to really, really zone into the important things and really choose what is the right thing that you want to experiment now, that you want to put your money in now, um, that is potentially the biggest bet that is going to yield the most results. Um, so especially in, in turbulent times, having this conversation continuously with your co-founder, with your founding team, all the time, making sure that you're on the right track is extremely important to do and when it comes to hiring as well is also to be very careful about who you hire and when you hire them and exactly what you expect from them it used to be also there was times when for for, for startups the metric of how many new hires am i pumping into the company every month was seen as a sign of success like i'm hiring 50 and 100 every month and that's seen as it's a great metric it's not because as, as soon as things get complicated the first thing you're going to look at is the, what you're paying money in every single month in salaries, and that'll be the first thing that you will want to, to, to cut. So just making sure that if I'm hiring, who am I hiring that is expected to take me from point A to point B, and not just in, in numbers, but basically just being very critical with the choices that you're making and asking yourself, is this feeding into my core? Is this helping me directly grow my core business? Or is, if it's not, then it's not the right time for it to happen. So, so building off what Ines was saying, Ahmed, would you say, did you go through a process earlier this year where, you know, you revised your, you know, years KPIs, OKRs, objectives? How did you manage the planning for this uh, current situation period that we're in? Or is it an opportunity for you of, for growth? يعني احنا بالنسبة لنا كانت ال ال الموضوع مختلف شوية إن احنا كنا we bootstrapped pylon. فكان بالنسبة لنا دايما ان احنا يكون عندنا بوزيتيف يونت ايكونومكس دي حاجة مهمة ده اتس ا نو برينر احنا من غيرها هنموت فكنا دايما بندخل في تشالنج ندخل في تشالنجز مع ادفايزرز او مع ناس حتى من عندنا النيو هايرز اللي دخلوا معانا ان احنا لا ان احنا وي نيد تو اكسلريت البيرن بتاعنا وان احنا جروينج ات 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 بريك نيك سبيد اللي هو تيرم مرعب بالنسبة لي بس بس كان ده دا دايما المايند سيت ان هو ليتس جرو ليتس جرو واحنا من ناحيتنا احنا ككو فاوندرز احنا في ريزيستنس من ناحيتنا عشان احنا بالنسبه لنا بوت سترابنج ده وان احنا البروفيتابيلتي ده ده كان من غيره احنا ما كناش هنبقى موجودين خالص يعني فكان دايما في الشد ده لغايه لما 
بقينا اتحطينا في سيتويشن دلوقتي ان هو بقى الموضوع مختلف تماما هو دلوقتي هو لازم يكون عندك بوزيتيف يونت ايكونومكس علشان الفلوس مش رخيصه زي ما كانت رخيصه زمان ومعاها ان انت تكون دايما شايف الريشيو بتاع الجروث على البيرن بتاعك يكون في الاخر بوزيتيف علشان من غيره ده برضو دي شركه مش اتراكتيف في في الوقت اللي احنا موجودين فيه ده دلوقتي فلا ديفينتلي احنا بالنسبه لنا الريفيجن كانت ان احنا نمنتين نفس المايند سيت ان احنا نكون مركزين اكتر مركزين على البيرن ريت بتاعنا هيكون اخباره ايه حتى لما وان ات كومز تو جروث ويا ذاتس كويت حسام هاو هاوز ات بين فور يو جايز يعني سؤال الانفستبيلتي سؤال يعني اساس احنا عند في في حاجتين بنتكلم فيهم من ناحيه انفستبل احب بس يعني اقول كده كلمه عليها هي اي حد بيريز محتاج يفكر هو بيريز ليه صح يعني هو لو بيريز عشان برودكت ماركت فيت فهو محتاج يوري الانفستر ان انا معايا التيم اللي هيقدر يعمل يوصل للبرودكت ماركت فيت احنا مش عارفين احنا عايزين نعمل ايه بس انا عارف ان في في توتال ادريسبل ماركت قد كده بيصرفوا قد كده المشكله دي الناس دي كلها عندها وال ماي تيم ويل بي ايبل تو فيجر ات اوت يمكن دي حاجه الواحد محتاج يركز عليها وبعد كده في مراحل تانية في واحد بيريز علشان يخش ماركت تاني طبعا تيم از امبورتنت ما حدش بيقول مش مهم مهم جدا ولكن لو انا عندي التراك ريكورد بتاع بينج بروفيتبل اند جروينج ان ذس ماركت اند ام جاست كوبي اند بيستينج ات ان ا ديفرنت ماركت او ام لوكاليزنج ات فور ا ديفرنت ماركت ساعتها بدام ده السبب بتاعي انا يعني محتاج احضر له بطريقه مختلفه اكون ببص ساعتها اكتر على الماركت سايز على الاوبورتونيتي على الاستابيليتي بتاعه الماركت اللي احنا رايحينه ده ولا بعد شويه رئيس الوزراء هيتشال مثلا زي حصل في باكستان مثلا فكل الحاجات دي بتبقى هي الايتمز اللي الواحد بيفكر فيها عشان كده بحس ما فيش فيش تمبلت كده مفيش اللي هو اه انت عايز تريز ركز على التيم ممكن تبقى الحاجه دي مش محتاجه تيم ممكن يبقى الحاجه محتاجه حاجه ثانيه في الوقت ده مفيش في وجهه نظري الانسر از طول المرحله اللي احنا فيها آه يعني مفيش حاجه كثيره ازودها غير يمكن ممكن احكي الاكسبيرينس عندنا يعني احنا آه في الشركه او في اوركس احنا دايما يونت آه ايكونومكس يعني بوزيتيف يونت ايكونومكس عندنا بوزيتيف ولكن احنا دايما وي ار بليدنج اون الاس جي ان اي اللي هو التيم سالاريز اند اول ذا ماركتنج اول ذات مع انها ممكن نارجو ان ذس از افكتنج ذا يونت ايكونومكس هاويفر الفتره اللي احنا فيها دي اللي عمل فاند ريزنج قبلها ومعاه كاش شابو سيف ات اللي لسه في البروسيس بتاع فاند ريزنج حاول تجري بسرعه وتلحق الفالويشنز بتاعت زمان ان الفتره الجايه ممكن الفالويشنز دي اصلا ما تبقاش افيلبل uh, زي ما قلت الفلوس مش تبقى رخيصه هي اكشلي كمان الشركات مش تبقى غاليه يعني مش تعرف تاخد الفالويشنز اللي احنا كنا بنشوفها قبل كده وركز على بروفيتابيلتي واولويز بيرن او بليد او يعني اي تيرم ذات يو وونت تو يوز فور ا ريزن يعني you are bleeding not to survive you're bleeding because you're growing this or you're bleeding because you're doing that لكن مش bleeding او burning money على الفاضي وخلاص okay makes sense you've you've just i mean to his point you've just raised around uh, have you revised your plans ولا yes. have they انا بس i have two points i want to add واحده على علاقه الوضع الحالي بالانفستمنت I think اللي بيحصل دلوقتي ان اليونت ايكونومكس بقت اهم من الجروث سنتين ثلاثه وناس هتنسى ثاني والفي سي هترجع ثاني تقول لك جروث اوني كوست والساك ده هتفضل تتكرر اوفر اند اوفر انت بس محتاج تختار ماشي انت عايز تمشي في اي سكه تطلع مع الترند وتنزل مع الترند ولا هتحاول تبني بزنس وذا باث تو بروفيتابيلتي وتحاول تكراك الجروث بطرق هيلثي اي ثينك ده قرار يعني قراري ونصيحتي بيرسونال بريفرنس لا يعني خلاص انا هختار سكه واستيك تو ات. ف واي ثينك ديفينتلي بيلدنج هيلثي يونت ايكونومكس تشوف الشركه بتكبر رايحه الباث بروفيتابيلتي بتكسب يعني دي التجاره يعني زي ما ربنا خلقها <تصفيق> يعني. اي ثينك ذس از ذس از ذا رايت واي تو دو ات. ان انت بقى تحرق وتجو نيجاتيف لازم تبقى في انت عارف بالظبط انت بتعمل ده امتى وازاي والفتره محدوده مش انت بتعمل ده وبعد 10 سنين بقى ان شاء الله هنجاوب سؤال هو ده بروفيتابل بزنس ولا لا؟ لان في بزنس مودلز كتير عملت كده هو بقى قاعد يجري 10 سنين هو مش عارف يجاوب السؤال. <تصفيق> النقطه الثانيه بتاعت ازاي تعدي الاوقات الصعبه بالذات في وقت زي اللي احنا فيه ده اي ثينك هافنج ا سترونج واي هافنج هافنج ا سترونج واي انت ليه بتعمل ده؟ يعني خلينا ناخد مثال بزهران. زهران هاف ا فيري سترونج واي هو انا ماشي 
هو مش بيعمل ده عشان يبقى عنده بزنس يعني بملايين اوكي فده معناه ان لما الدبريشن يهت ماشي عنده ريزيلينس سايكولوجيكلي عشان عنده سبب قوي لكن انت لو بتعمل شركه عشان تبني شركه بملايين لما تيجي بقى الايام الدنيا تضلم الريزيلينس بتاعك هيتاثر جدا وده هيرفلكت على التيم بتاعك جدا How does that reflect on, with you يعني with your company do you have a strong why is that what's driving you I had you? to figure out my why okay. along the way يعني انا بدات okay. بعمل شركه اوكي وي ام ام فيري اكسايتد على البرودكت والكونسيومر سايكولوجي والحاجات دي وعايز اعمل موضوع فيري كرييتيف بعدين في الطريق بدات اكسبلور ماي واي والشركه بدات تشفت مع الواي ده واحنا كنا محظوظين ان احنا قبل ما الوضع ده يحصل بثلاث اربع شهور وي ديسايدد تو فليب اور يونت ايكونومكس اور جروس بروفيت مارجنز طلعت من سالب 60 لبوزيتيف 36 في اربع شهور وده قبل ما الوضع ده يحصل يعني ده كان ستر من ربنا يعني مش اكتر فبس اي ثينك يعني النصيحه دي مهمه يعني اتس اون ذا هيومين بارت اوف ذا اكسبيرينس ان انت لما يكون عندك سبب قوي انت عامل عشان الشركه دي هتبقى وورث فايتنج فور اي لاف ذس ادفايس يا اي جست وان اد وان ثينج يعني ان ماي اوبينيون اونستلي ديفينتلي يعني يونت ايكونومكس اند مارجنز ار امبيراتيف اند ار اكستريملي امبورتنت ان ذا واي تو جرو بس ات ديز نوت مين ذات جروث is not important or it does yeah. not mean the growth is secondary i was saying that i مثلا ما بكبرش ثلاث شهور بس my economics are growing that's still not positive either because still a big part of of that term product market fit means that the customers actually want to buy your product and you're able to reach more and more people so if we're ثابتين and we're not able to يعني, acquire more customers month over month and considerably يعني, grow quite fast then there is an issue in the business model that you have to go back and iterate. And it does not mean that we are done. So in both of them are, are important. And in a lot of ways, they go hand in hand if you're able to focus on your customer. And if you're able to give your customer the right thing that they really, that they really need and not what is maybe a cool idea that you're fascinated about or something that sounds interesting, but it is genuinely relevant in solving someone's problem or someone's pain, or even adding value to that customer or to that user that they're willing to pay that extra pound for this service. Um, both of them kind of go hand in hand, and even in times of economic downturn, yes, every pound in terms of but it still does not diminish the need that you that we need to have for consistent and, and 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 fast growth as well yeah it's about striking that balance between both absolutely the last words of wisdom from both of you is advice to someone who's uh, starting a business in this environment in this market in egypt early stage uh, maybe thinking of raising their first institution around so ahmed what what would your advice be we heard great advice from these two um, my advice would be to, to focus on the team, definitely, uh, because I believe in the team هو اللي بيكون واقف معك في الأوقات الصعبة وهو اللي بتقدر to navigate بي أي حاجة. ف definitely the team أهم عنصر في ال في startup. عايش توصل إيه focus on the team. So يعملوا إيه؟ من الاختيار من الأول إن هو يكون في culture واحدة بتعملوا عليها إن هو يكون في الاخر مش حد جاي من منتاليتي مقفوله ان هو انا جاي مركز على فانكشن معينه فانا مش هعمل غير الفانكشن دي لا عشان احنا في الـ في الـ في كستارت اب في العادي انت بتكون محتاج ان انت كله يكون بيعمل كل حاجه ات اني بوينت اوف تايم فاي بيليف بالمنتاليتي دي مهمه قوي فديفينتلي ماي فيرست ادفايس از التيم ما تهزرش خالص في الهايرنج وزي ما بيقولوا يعني او احب اقولها هاير سلو اند فاير فاست uh, definitely the team aham answer. Sometimes within the team aspect, it's, it's the communication and the transparency, right? Because you might have great intentions and you know, you're doing the best, but you're not articulating that to the rest of the team or you're not communicating that to the team. Fayahsal, these gaps which end up uh, backfiring. Hussein, any... Uh, Yeah, برضو هرجع أغلبية الحاجات قلت. Make sure there's a real problem, a real pain. طول ما في pain, إذا في opportunity to make money, اتأكد إن ال pain ده بيخاطب ناس كتير أو بيخاطب ناس كتير enough for your profitability goal. 
assemble the right people around you. Right people meaning and them نفس the culture. بيحبوا اللي هما بيعملوه بيحبوا الشغل بتاعهم مش علشان يشتغلوا 24 ساعه ولكن عشان لما يشتغلوا يطلعوا احسن حاجه عندهم make sure to delegate make sure to to believe in that there is always someone better than you doing who can do what you're doing so that you can be open minded enough to find that person identify them trust them and work with them و grow بس ركز برضو على ال profitability. Thank you very much. Any yeah, I I'd say one tiny thing is um, كل طبعا كلام الألدا is is 100% true. But also as much as possible try to focus on yourself as the entrepreneur as well yep. in isolating as much as you can your ego from your company. A lot of entrepreneurs, their company is themselves, and it is the reflection of their self-worth immediately. And anything that happens to the company, or any critique, or any feedback, they take immediately as a feedback on themselves, and it, they become defensive. And I've seen, unfortunately, founders that have driven their company to the ground because they're not able to critique, listen to criticism or, or pivot on certain things. But as much as possible, know that it's a separate entity. It is its own entity. It is not a reflection of you. If for any reason the company fails, it does not mean that you as a person are a failure that cannot do anything else. Uh, just make sure that spend conscious time actively isolating this from this. And of course, make sure that you, are, you have a clear reason. You're able to answer why am I doing this, especially in times of, of downturn. Because if your answer is, I think it's cool to be like an entrepreneur or to be a founder, to put it on LinkedIn and people say, I'm going to do a startup, then don't do it. It's not, it's a tabu game. Yeah, and if this is the objective, then don't do it. It needs to be something that is stronger than this yeah. because behind like the, the glamour and the articles that you hear about raising arqam, يعني, insane figures of millions in the past, the daily is not like this. Every day we're sitting in the house, 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 in the house. This is what my daily, day, my daily looks like. So if you're able to, يعني, if this sounds appealing to you, so that we're doing something, we're actually solving a problem, and we're doing something, then I'd say go for it. Otherwise, we're mm -hmm. A great note to end this discussion on. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed, Hussein, Ines, Hussein, and Rahmi. Amazing. So we just heard a bunch of very hard questions asked and the next fireside chat is actually answering an even tougher one. We are going to be hearing from Sara Battuti from UN, uh, a UNFCCC ambassador and founder of eConsult and our own acceleration manager Yasmin Nagetti as they try to answer the question, can startups save the planet? Let's hear it for them. Okay, Sara, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. So before we get to the questions of if and how startups can save uh, the planet, I know I just want to take a little bit of time to discuss the many different hats that you've worn from policy to entrepreneurship. Can you tell us a little bit more about your roles, what you currently do? So, um, hi everyone, Ayman. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I have particular roles uh, that I fill. I'm originally uh, an architect. Uh, 20 years ago, I graduated very, very occupied with the future of architecture and the relevance of what it is that we are uh, intending to do. My role in, with the UN framework for climate change as a global ambassador is to represent non-state actors and to represent uh, the uh, civil society, NGOs, entrepreneurs, and private sector in trying to get them as engaged as possible in the climate action 
Race to Zero and Race to Resilience um, movement. So that's the initial role. Uh, I have been uh, serving as a senior advisor to the Egyptian president since 2014. My primary role was to uh, discuss with a then very fluid situation in Egypt. You know, we didn't really have government. It wasn't really, you know, a state then. I don't know how to describe it, but you know what I mean. And then uh, I come in and I start talking about climate change. Uh, and I start trying to make the crowd believe that we have to do something and we have to take part in this global movement, otherwise we'll be sidelined. And in being sidelined, not only as a country, but as a nation, and we will not be able to develop economically or have any kind of impact if we're not part of this discussion. And therefore, I have been working on this since 2014 with a huge belief. Uh, I had quite a challenge since that, uh, you know, with the incoming of uh, President Trump, the U.S. exited the agreement. So you're trying to convince more and more people that we still need to stay in the agreement and hold force. So that's a lot of policy work and a lot of convincing. Uh, my own personal uh, hat, the one that I wear with, uh, with great pride, is I am a green entrepreneur. I left the family business to start a company that really wants to make green architecture something that is mainstream, something that is available. Uh, at that time, there was no such thing in Egypt as registering for what is a green building consultant. I mean, what do you do that is different from architecture? And uh, my family were not very supportive of my exit from uh, the, uh, the business. And therefore, I started my company by selling my car. And that's the capital that I had. And we started the company set out to disrupt the conventional architecture sector because we saw all over the world that green buildings are exclusive to very high income community, communities, exclusive to a particular technology, and we need them. Uh, it was exciting for me to work on a product that every single human being on earth uses. We all use buildings, and therefore, we need to get them right. So that's how we started the company eConsult. And in 2022, January uh, 2022, I started another startup that uh, pr produces um, furniture from upcycled waste, waste wood. So I've been doing this, uh, this green thing for a long time. It's been a very interesting uh, space to occupy policy and then, you know, and have this uh, very creative aspect. So moving on to sort of the entrepreneurial side, why do you think green economy, climate uh, change, adaptation or resilience, why, why should it matter to people entering the space of entrepreneurship? So you've talked a little bit from the policy side. I just feel like you can tell us a little bit more from the entrepreneurial side why this is a big topic right now, why should we be paying attention and so on. I don't think that it's, it's big right now as much as it is urgent right now. There, there's, you know, we have to be very careful when we talk about what's trendy. You know, the word sustainability has been very trendy for a long time, but the business of doing sustainability is very tricky. And it's going to be very tricky to, to work in the business of being green or doing green business. You know, an ecopreneur is somebody that is trying to change how the sector works. And so you have to identify to what rate you're going to, you, you, you know, you need to be an athlete in this. And I think some of the speakers before were saying exactly how they start off, you know, pace yourself and everything. Um, the reason why it's important, and I'm, I'm, I think I might get in trouble for saying this, but I don't think in a few years we're going to have the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and then COP, and then everything. I think it's just going to be development. And development is not going to come in pieces as it looks right now. I think it's very fragmented and compartmentalized right now just to usher in so much of what's happening. We have to think about not just being on a global scale, a movement. We have to think about trying to do business at a time and in a world where everything is fluid. Look, politics is fluid. 
financing is fluid. You get shocks that are coming in and out like that. You cannot be convention, conventional, and you cannot be always promoting this, um, you know, growth during sp stability. That's not really what's happening right now. Instability is becoming the norm, and you have to swim upstream and downstream, and, and you have to be very agile and flexible in it. So I think there's so much room for diversity, and there's so much room for growth, especially when it comes to moving towards greener economies and for entrepreneurs. It, the, the variety is becoming very big, and this is what I think is very relevant right now for entrepreneurs. You know, when we think green entrepreneurs, we think of somebody who's in recycling, somebody who's doing something to do with energy, but the scope is becoming very big. The scope is about behavior. Now, it's about consuming and, and producing, and behavior is endless. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we're at the cusp of a, a huge expansion when it comes to this. It's a really, really energetic time. We should take advantage of it. So great, this is a really good time to also ask you, where do you see sort of the biggest opportunities? So you mentioned that we tend to think of it as mostly recycling and other sorts of stereotypical businesses. And now is a really great time to also shed light on what other areas there are for entrepreneurs who are looking to enter this space. Okay, the first thing that I think there's a very big opportunity. So we have our, our we have, you know, the, the green champions. We have the renewables. Definitely there is more and more interest in how the supply chain and sourcing food and agriculture. Um, the intergovernmental uh, report on, uh, on climate change, the panel on climate change, just issued uh, a really uh, sobering report that, hey, where's the construction industry? Where are the architects? What's happening with green buildings? And once you see movement into questioning how an entire sector as sophisticated like that is, is being called to action, that's when you know that you have to start gearing yourselves that there will be potential for green growth in that sector, in how we make cities this is the first one. The second one is definitely in the retail and how we purchase. This is a growing market because suddenly we're all conforming to carbon footprinting and, and impact and all of us. So this is a very interesting one. The one that I feel is very relevant to Egypt and Africa is we have to bear in mind when we're moving into green tech and green entrepreneurship, who's our customer? Okay. For me, it's particularly interesting because, you know, if you, if you look at specific initiatives like A Decent Life or Millennial Villages or Africa, etc., that is 58 million people. 58 million people require housing, require buildings, and these 58 million people will never, ever hire an architect. We're not considered the service provider that will come in and, you know, do interior decoration for these homes. It's not their loss, it's my loss, that I need to tap into the market of rural, low-income communities. And this is the potential. This is the potential we need to explore. The technology, is it accessible? Is it affordable? Is it scalable? Is it culturally relevant? There are huge opportunities to work on water, energy, uh, the provision of, um, of food, ag tech, green buildings, but not just for the very, you know, exclusive city, the new cities um, kind of, kind of uh, customer. We need to look into the rural communities and we need to develop products that are relevant to them. And another thing that is very interested is there is a pool of knowledge within rural communities, within low-income communities, that if you do not utilize this knowledge as an entrepreneur, wow, you're missing out. There is embedded R&D there that if you can tap into, it's incredible. We did that. We have the first carbon-neutral low-income village in the MENA region five years ago. I did that with Egyptian architects, with local labor, with local material, and I had to sit down with the tribe leaders and I had to take their, in, their inputs into how to keep the insects away and how do they move around when it comes to different seasonality. These are things that if I graduated from wherever I graduated from and read as many books and tapped into many apps, I still wouldn't have gotten that piece of invaluable knowledge. So we have to be 
very good at knowing where we get our information from, and the end user, we have to empower them to be part of the design of the product that we're making. Otherwise, let's just always stick to that part of the line. You know, I think green entrepreneurship has to serve and has to work with and develop with the incredible amount of resources that you have there. So I think that one of the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs entering the space are facing is exactly trying to reconcile making an impact to that customer segment that you mentioned, but also remaining profitable. So you mentioned, of course, that this specific customer segment wouldn't necessarily hire an architect and so on, and yet these are the people on the other side of the opportunity. So do you have any insights or advice how to reconcile impact and also profitability or sustainability of the business, like maybe drawing onto your own um, you know, two businesses? Um, I'm, I'm not very good at giving advice, but I can tell you exactly what happens, and it works. So obviously, you, know, you can turn that into advice. But we've had our fortunes turned several times. So as a green company starting off, we always had, why would I need you? Why would I want to go green? Keep tabs on the policy. Keep tabs on the direction that you know, systems are moving and economies are moving into. We knew that the minute the energy subsidies will be removed, and this is a, this is a, a national uh, reform initiative, that we will suddenly have people come to us and telling us, listen, I don't care what the building looks like, just save me all of this money. Suddenly, you are commodifying waste. That's my angle of entry into the market. I'm saving water, I'm saving energy, and I'm saving on materials, and therefore I'm disrupting the architecture sector. We built the first mosque without a minaret simply because there was no one to call out in the middle of the desert to come to prayer. Why would I need a minaret? Why would I need X amount of building material? And you know, we had to go through the Ministry of Endowment and explain to them rating systems and everything. It's, it's been a journey. But keep tabs with the directions that are happening. And this is, this is a very good starting point. The second thing is, when you are ahead of what's happening, you're very informative and useful for your clients. They keep coming back to you. We keep coming, you know, having reoccurring clients. Design a new building. Listen, how am I functioning? What's wrong? Why am I not retaining people? What's the next step? So you have to always be knowledgeable, and there is absolutely no need to greenwash. Don't say something if you're not doing it. Just stick to what you do, do it very well, make it accessible and easy to follow and repeatable. And then you have to work on, in, in our case, we entered the market at the time when everyone was saying sustainability. We had mud huts, we had buildings made of clay. And to be quite honest, the reputation of green buildings was not that, um, was not that either well known, and there were a lot of misconceptions that green buildings are either unsafe or unhygienic in the middle of the desert in the shape of huts, or they are extremely uh, expensive and not affordable. And we had to start breaking this down. I don't think we're in that same place right now. I think we are much more enlightened and we are much more willing to listen. And if we have successes on the ground, it's, it's, this, is, this, is, you know, this is the opportunity. So I would definitely advise that before you say we provide good green buildings or I am a green business, show them the model on the ground. This is it. It's been up and running. This is the cost of construction. It's the same as conventional. And then you can start talking about why not and making a difference. You build that trust, the clients start coming to you because they want to affiliate with someone who does something good and does it at a decent cost. It's, it's, it's that simple. Absolutely. I just want to go back to the phrase where you said keep tabs on what's happening. Are there, what, what should we be keeping tabs on right now for anybody who's interested in entering this space? Are there any specific key points that you want to highlight, something specific for entrepreneurs to keep tabs on at this specific point in time? Um, this is relevant to, to say, COP27 as well. First of all, you need to look at how energy is moving around the world. You know, uh, suddenly we have Europe is interested in buying energy from here. So look at the energy providing companies, some of which are here today, etc. Look at the global trends of what's happening. Look at scarcity 
in management, uh, in, in resources. So we know that Egypt has a water scarcity issue. We know that the geopolitics involved is leading to this. So investment in water saving technologies cross sector is an important one. You know this, it's not, it's not like we're going to be surprised. Okay, but then also make sure that you're operating in the right context with your business. Still, until today, you will still find resistance, you know, to plant-based food. Okay, is that relevant here? Plant-based food, is it changing? Is it a game changer here in Egypt? Or am I going to build a company that is going to serve a particular income strata? And I'm still not talking to the rest of that 60 million. So you have to be relevant as to what you're operating. Also look at low tech affordable solutions. This is where a lot of the investment in a lot of, uh, a lot of the new startups is going because you want to scale it out to Africa. You want to scale it out to uh, you know, uh, communities. Plus also, it's a very good place to source your hiring from the informal sector. There's a lot of creativity there. Um, so verified tech, which is a new word, very tech, soft tech, all of these new terminologies are coming in because it's relevant to Africa, it's relevant to North Africa, it's relevant to Egypt, and we'll hear more and more about this. So keep tabs on the trends that are going to solve your issues and your problems and also allow you to grow. The last thing that you want is to you know, um, end up investing in creating a product and your principal competitor is a giant mega company creating this product with you know millions and millions of uh, dollars to burn uh, each week on on r d okay i mean you can do that you can try that out if you want everyone's free to do whatever you want but in my case i wanted to make sure that we're doing a product that's going to change the way things are being done and i want to prove that we can do it at a local level on a final note, I think um, some of us know about COP27. I think a lot of us don't. So can you just shed some light on what it is, why it's important, how potential entrepreneurs can benefit from it, what can they hope to gain? Yeah, so, uh, so COP, uh, COP uh, in general is a, um, it's a series of negotiations, right? It's a bunch of really, ideally, honestly, politicians. They are sitting there, they're having negotiations after negotiations, and it's a very um, organized and grown-up way of having a conversation around tackling climate change. So it's, it's, it's not very alien anymore. COP used to happen and it was some sort of like UN event that was happening with governments and that's it. The reason why COP is becoming more and more relevant is that they've discovered that if you lock up the politicians in a room and governments in a room to solve your problems without having your voice present in that, the outcome is probably going to be very um, anticlimactic and a bit useless. So COP is an extension of the conversation with everyone because we are all affected by climate change. I know what I need, some people don't know what they need, some people underestimate the science behind climate change, but at the end of the day, you need to be present at that negotiation table with your voice brought forward because deals come out of COP, pacts come out of COP and agreements come out of COP. The whole point of COP is that it's a series of countries that were able to go through an industrial revolution and really move forward exceptionally quickly without any accountability or anyone holding them back about the environmental issues. It's our turn now to go through economic development. But however, we, are now, we now have a checklist of things that we have to stick to. So, so how do you negotiate? You negotiate that, hey, listen, you've done your part. You were not held accountable. It's my turn today to grow as an economy, to flourish, to create jobs. Why don't you help me pay to do so in a way where I'm not contributing further to environmental degradation? That's it. That's what the grown-ups sit at the table and talk about. That's what the politicians are there to do, to represent your interest as a country. Not all countries have the same challenges and not all countries have the same access to solutions, but every single country has society and community suffering from the problem. 
So it's a sense of ownership with accountability and negotiations to allow everyone to have a fair chance at growth. That is what COP is about. Yes, it's viewed a bit of an expo that everybody wants to be there, that everybody, but really ideally, the most important thing about COP is the build up to COP and the representation to COP of what you're trying to do, the white papers, the societal dialogues, the debates that are happening that are put forward to government so that government can speak uh, with uh, a more inclusive tone uh, at, uh, at the event itself. Great. So thank you so much for your insights. I think you've shed light on a lot of things that perhaps a lot of people are hearing for the first time today. It was a pleasure to have you. There's a hat that I didn't mention. So Please. I'm very proudly <laughs> serving on the advisory board of the School of Business. And I'm really happy that they have the green, um, you know, the green uh, take on many of the issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sara. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was definitely food for thought. And now we're going to take a short break before our program resumes on the garden stage outside. So please enjoy yourselves, meet some people, get some refreshments, and be ready to be there at 4.30 when we're starting, inshallah, with the rest of our program. Thank you. Would also like to remind you that you can access the full agenda and the list of our speakers on your name tag. So you'll find a QR code in the middle of your name tag where you can actually scan and get to the website. <laughs> 